Okay. Uh, again, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the uh, first uh, fireside chat for uh, 2021. I hope everybody is uh, doing well and staying healthy as much as possible and enjoying their family and um, hope, hopefully having a good start to uh, the new year. Uh, today uh, is going to be mostly status updates. Uh, I wanted to take some time to uh, bring everybody up to speed on what's going on with the General Grand Council. Um, and in, in the spirit of making sure that uh, we have uh, full disclosure and um, um, transparency, we, uh, you know, I'll, I'll present this uh, warts and all. So you know where we're succeeding and where we're uh, struggling. Um, and we'll uh, take any questions at the end. Um, but uh, first off, uh, I asked Tom uh, to uh, give us an update on uh, CMMRF and the great things that CMMRF is doing. So Tom, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Um, I had a high school English teacher that said you should make your presentations long enough to cover the subject, but short enough to make it interesting. So in writing up my presentation, I tried to keep it short and uh, therefore it may be, may, may bring up a lot of questions, but um, at the 33rd Triennial held in 1978, the General Grand Council formed a foundation whose charity was the research um, in the prevention of arterial cirrhosis. Um, that's hard to spell, let alone say. Uh, thus began the Cryptic Masons Medical Research Foundation and a relationship with Indiana University School of Medicine. The research has progressed from the study of hardening of the arteries uh, to today's research in the use of stem cells to treat peripheral arterial disease. Now that's a big word. And if you don't know, um, how many of you know someone who um, has had an amputation because they got a sore and the sore wouldn't heal and gangrene set in um, with the use of stem Stem cells, they have been 97% uh, successful in preventing amputations because of this. Abdominal aortic aneurysms. Have you ever heard of the Widowmaker? You know, those athletes that, uh, you know, play a football game, walk into the locker room and drop dead. Um, most of the time, that's caused by. Um, an aortic aneurysm. Um, cancer, diabetes, heart failure, stroke, arthritis. Hey, you know, there are some mornings when I wish there was something I could do about my arthritis. And I'm sure some of you feel the same way. Uh, pancreatitis, and most recently, COVID-19. Companions, these are diseases that we have experienced in one way or another. As the research evolves, so has the CMMRF Board of Trustees. From a beginning as a three-man panel, our board of contains um, the five elected officers of General Grand Council, Grand Master Monty Glover, Deputy Grand Master Bill Snyder, uh, PCW, yours truly, recorder Steve Bakke, treasurer Chuck McCollum, and four members who are elected at large. The, four, the at large members are Paul Friend from Florida, Dr. Joe Rausch from Arkansas, uh, John Rednauer from, I'm going to say Washington, but it could be Oregon, uh, and Dr. Raphael Sarin from Brazil represents our international community. In addition, all living past most puissant grandmasters and past grand treasurer, Charles Hollinger, serve as ex officio trustees. 
Our donations over the past 40 years have grown from a few thousand dollars a year uh, to a few hundred thousand dollars a year. Last year, we were able to give um, in the neighborhood of $200,000 to uh, Indiana University for their, um, for their research. The increased donations from CMMRF have, um, have the expansion, uh, now I lost my plates and my notes. The increased donations from CMMRF uh, have expanded the research done at IU and has facilitated the, pick, the purchase of equipment essential to maintaining cutting edge research. Dr. Mike Murphy, the head of the Indiana Center for Vascular Biology has been able to apply for grants on the ratio of one CMMRF dollar to seven outside dollars. Companions, this means that for every dollar we give, eight dollars are generated for research into diseases that affect all of us. This is a pretty meaning statistic to me. At the December meeting of the CMMRF Board of Trustees, we adopted a goal of raising $500,000 for CMMRF in 2021. This is a stretch goal, but well within, um, within our reach. To this end, we have received a challenge gift of $50,000. The challenge is that we have to raise the funds to match the gift by April 1st, 2021. This past Saturday, the Grand Council of the District of Columbia made a pledge to raise $2,000 by the 1st of April with a stretch goal of 5,000. The Grand Council of Delaware is talking about matching what DC does. We're about the same size. Uh, we are well on our way to meeting the challenge goal. Traditionally, the funds for CMMRF have been raised by state chairmen in each jurisdiction. There has been little guidance either in the form of materials, suggestions, or knowledge. In spite of this, our state chairmen have done a tremendous job increasing giving year over year. In an attempt to improve the job being done by our state chairman, a new position has been created that of area or regional uh, coordinator to support the state chairs. Each coordinator has been charged to set up Zoom calls with his state chairman on a regular basis to share ideas, promote camaraderie, and perhaps a little friendly competition. You know, something about maple syrup. And, you know, if you've got the best maple syrup, maybe you can raise the most money for CMMRF. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think we can have a lot of fun doing it. The coordinators so far uh, that we have appointed are Richard Fowler from New York uh, for the Northeast, Sid Conley from Alabama for the Southeast, and Tar Todd Carpenter of Indiana for the East Central. As other candidates are identified, we will appoint them. Um, our Grandmaster has adopted a theme of communicate, innovate, and transparency. Through the decryption, we will be communicating our progress toward our goals. However, we ask that you communicate with us. Please feel free to share your ideas. The only bad idea is the one kept to yourself. We are looking for a few new ways to make our charity CMMRF a first rate foundation. Again, with your feedback, we can always be improving. By these means, we will try to be transparent and trust you will find us true to our word. You joined Freemasonry because you believed in the tenets of brotherly love, relief, and truth. As Freemasons, we are charged 
with making the world a better place. Think of the difference we can make by reducing or eliminating the effects of the diseases I have mentioned. The relief to our fellow man. I will, paste my, I will post my email account in the chat if you would like to contact me to make a pledge and we will be glad to accept your pledge or get more information. Uh, I, will always, I will also post the address for CMMRF where you can send your donations. Um, if you have any questions, now's your opportunity. Any questions for Tom? If not, uh, thank you, Tom. And, sure, I uh, think Steve has everybody on mute. <laughs> oh. If anybody has any questions, uh, either raise hand or uh, go ahead and unmute. Okay. I just want to comment. It's, it's very, very impressive, very uh, brief, but on the other hand, very informative. Yeah, I learned a lot about history and foundation and and actually updates what happened in a great presentation yeah thank you nicola yeah thank you okay um i'll get into to my updates um as i said uh, this this will be warts and all so it might uh, a lot of it may come as a big surprise to a lot of you as to things that are going on or or not going on or working well uh but i do want to start off on a couple of call outs uh, one, uh, I want to uh, really recognize and commend Will Highsmith for the wonderful job that he's doing on the uh, decryption, uh, our online um, uh, blog slash magazine. Uh, Will uh, bird dogs that for us and, and is our editor in chief of it. And he really does an outstanding job of getting the articles together and uh, getting them up so that everybody stays uh, in the know as to what's going on uh, uh, in encrypting masonry all over the world uh, and has uh, put up some outstanding art articles. So if you haven't had a chance to look at the decryption or if you haven't subscribed to it, I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, and I want to commend Steve and the technology committee. Uh, without that committee, uh, we would not have been able to do the numerous uh, things that we have uh, uh, accomplished this year uh, since uh, before the triennial started, uh, they've worked hard to make sure that uh, the 47th triennial came off uh, very well, as well as helping the general grand chapter with their triennial. And of course, all of the numerous, numerous meetings that we have had on Zoom over the last several months uh, that uh, have actually, I think, drawn the uh, General Grand Council much closer together, uh, not only from the officers level, but also internationally and nationally uh, with the uh, uh, recorders calls and, um, and being able to meet with uh, those uh, companions uh, that uh, are, are struggling with uh, issues in their jurisdictions. Um, Wanted to start off with a financial update. Uh, we're behind in getting the financial systems up and running, uh, but we hope to have them uh, done very soon. Steve is working hard with uh, our uh, general grand treasurer and uh, Dustin Verity, who is a, a forensic accountant in Hawaii, uh, and he is running our internal audit committee. And once uh, that is complete, we can start getting our uh, financial reports produced. Uh, we will uh, start sharing those updates as to where we are in terms of our income and expenses with all the companions. And I'll probably use uh, this meeting as, as a uh, platform, one of the platforms to disseminate that information for anybody that's interested in them. Uh, the audit, uh, we uh, committed to a uh, two triennial audit. So the 46th and 47th uh, triennial uh, are uh, in the process of being audited. Uh, we're also behind in that. We're slowly uh, but surely gathering the information that's been requested by our auditor. 
uh, it remains a priority for us, but since the beginning of the triennial, we have been distracted by other pressing issues, which you are about to hear. Um, a lot of our time and energy has been focused on the international scene. Uh, we've had uh, a couple of uh, hot spots, and um, one of those has been Brazil. Uh, we've had a lot of ongoing challenges in Brazil. The primary issue, which led to the revocation of the Grand Charter last triennium by uh, Most Pleasant David Grendel, uh, was that uh, all the York Right bodies were being run by two individuals who created a supreme Grand York Right that controlled all of the finances and selected who would be the elected positions. In some cases, these were companions that had not even served in the prerequisite uh, offices or were not even members of a recognized Grand Lodge. Uh, we found that there were serious errors in the reporting of their membership on the annual reports and that they were underpaying their per capita. This was something the General Grand Council and the Grand Encampment made, uh, made an issue of and which ultimately led to the expulsion of the two individuals who were running the so-called Supreme Grand York Rite from the Cryptic Masons. The Grand Chapter's High Priest was a member of uh, the Grand Chapter of Brazil, uh, was uh, uh, a member of an unrecognized Grand Lodge in Brazil. We brought this to the attention of the General Grand Chapter, but had little to no response from them. We made several attempts to engage with them over the Brazil issue to no avail. At one point, the General Grand Council took the position that because this unrecognized Grand Lodge broke away from a regular and recognized Grand Lodge, then they are considered regular and recognized. That is not the case, and the General Grand High Priest at the time later retracted that position. Ultimately, the Grand High Priest was removed, but this was only after the Grand Lodge of Sao Paulo pulled the permission of the Grand Chapter from operating in their jurisdiction Several other grand jurisdictions soon followed. The Grand Master of Sao Paulo constituted a new grand chapter in his jurisdiction under his authority as the first principal of the Holy Royal Arch of Jerusalem in Brazil. This new grand chapter was to follow the American York Rite system, however. This was quickly recognized by the Grand Encampment and later by the General Grand Council as an acceptable prerequisite for membership in the council. This was done to protect our members from losing their memberships because of the bad relationship the Grand Chapter under the General Grand Chapter had with the Grand Lodges of, in Brazil. We are currently working hard with our, our regional deputy and ambassador in Brazil to get those councils that have complied with our requirements formed into a new Grand Council of Brazil under dispensation. The long range plans will be to con con constitute multiple grand councils within Brazil that will make them more manageable. In Italy, which we have our ambassador on today, uh, Alessandro, he's the one with the really stylish glasses. Um, Italy is having similar issues as Brazil. In Italy's case, the grand chapter acts as if it is running to uh, is the ruling body of the York right. And if any elected officers of the Grand Council do not conform to their wishes, they expel them from the chapter, thus kicking them out of the council and installing someone that is more malleable to their designs. This is causing serious membership losses in Italy from the council. And again, we have tried to work with the General Grand Chapter on these issues with little cooperation to date. We will be uh, reconstituting the Grand Council of Italy soon under dispensation so they can start afresh with the complete understanding that they are an independent York Rite body and will not be controlled by either the Grand Chapter or Grand Commandery. Um, that's, that's the two biggest things on the international stage. Uh, most every place else is running pretty normal. Um, we're uh, also working on a new ambassador's badge. Uh, those of you that may be ambassadors uh, on the call. Um, we, uh, in the past, we had what was affectionately referred to as the hubcap. Uh, this was a very big uh, 
uh, metal. It was really good in uh, aiding in self-defense. If you were ever uh, accosted, you could hit somebody in the head with it and knock them out completely. Um, this new one will be uh, more stylized as a, uh, a badge that you would wear on, on the breast of a coat. Um, and it's going to reflect, uh, we hope uh, to everybody, uh, what exactly uh, their position is and, and the important duties that they have. Um, more on that will come as we get the uh, um, designs uh, fully completed. Uh, we're working with uh, updates and changes to the Constitution and bylaws. Uh, Bill Schneider is, is chairing the uh, committee on uh, the Constitution and bylaws, and he's working on uh, putting together uh, not only those things that we had intended to cover in the last triennium, but also things that have ar arisen since then. Uh, Anybody that has ever read our current constitution and bylaws will see that there are a lot of areas there where it references uh, in the bylaws, it references stuff in the constitution that doesn't exist. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that's really kind of vague and, and uh, easily misunderstood. And then there's things that we wanna add. So uh, the intent is for us to address that at the uh, first triennial session uh, that we will have in Minneapolis. Hopefully we'll, we will make the deadline to get all of those um, uh, resolutions or uh, my personal preference is to get one resolution out that will cover a complete restatement of the constitution and bylaws, uh, but uh, we will see how that progresses. Um, triennial updates, uh, we're still waiting uh, for the books to be closed out and receive an accounting for the income and expenses for the previous triennial. We need any of the remaining funds from that event to be the seed money for the triennial in 2023. Kevin Sample, who is on the call today, thank you for being here, Kevin, uh, is uh, working hard to set up for the 48th triennial event to hopefully be held in Branson, Missouri. Uh, we are on track to have our first uh, triennial meeting in Minneapolis in conjunction with the Grand Encampments Triennial. Registration for our meeting will be through the Grand Encampments registration process. Um, so when the Grand Encampment uh, gets their uh, registration uh, link set up and site, then you'll be able to actually register for that. It will be in person uh, as of today. Um, we have confidence that uh, it will go forward in person, um, but uh, if for any reason uh, it's determined that uh, uh, safe and, uh, safety and health uh, issues are, are a concern, then we will fall back to a virtual Zoom meeting. Um, and uh, Jack Harper from Texas is, is our, our lead uh, with the Grand Encampment on uh, coordinating all of those efforts uh, with that meeting. Uh, and of course, our second triennial meeting will be a virtual meeting uh, in 2022 that will be held here on Zoom. And its primary focus will be uh, uh, financial status updates and uh, dealing with any holdover um, emergent uh, issues that we may need to take care of. Uh, the one in Minneapolis is primarily focused on um, dealing with the Constitution and bylaw uh, changes and uh, getting those approved, uh, uh, ratifying our um, ritual, and uh, constituting, uh, approving the Constitution of um, a couple of uh, grand, uh, grand uh, councils uh, that didn't make the timeline for the uh, 47th triennial meeting. And with that, I think that's about it. Uh, Steve, was there anything major that I missed? Chat. Oh, okay. And yes, uh, I apologize for uh, missing John Green. He's our uh, calendar czar. Um, there's uh, been a lot of uh, uh, issues going on, of course, with K uh, the COVID stuff. 
but uh, he's been uh, doing a great job at trying to keep our calendar up to date and uh, he continues to improve it as we go along. Um, again, I, I really can't uh, say enough about our technology committee and, and those associated with the technology committee. They, they do a wonderful job. Uh, they meet pretty much weekly uh, to uh, discuss uh, all of the things uh, surrounding the technology that keeps General Grand Council running and uh, helps us to uh, not only help ourselves, but also help other organizations as well that, that may benefit from our, our skills and knowledge that we've uh, collected over the months. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions anybody might have on any of this. You guys are always so quiet. You got to have most, some. Most poor, I'm, I'm probably the noisiest one around. <laughs> um, most poor, um, if the idea hope is hopefully to be able to meet in person in Minneapolis in early August, I'm, I'm wondering if there has been any thought given to the regional conferences. The first of one is normally the Northeast Conference. Um, I, I would I would think that we're probably thinking of doing a face to face at that point since it's usually the end uh, second weekend in September. Um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that or if any of the people who are involved in it are on the uh, conference call this evening. Uh, if they could give us a little bit of an idea of what may transpire. Is there any any representative from the Northeast? Uh... Regional conference on the call. Yes. Um, oh, go ahead. I, I want to say I think at this point Sandy uh, Carstens, who's not on the call, unfortunately, would be the best person as a source for that discussion. But we uh, we right now are planning and hoping it will be in person. But that's still, you know, as, as we all know, an open question. Yeah. So I, if your thoughts or questions specifically, maybe we can try to use that as a starting point for, I assume the questions other people have as well. Uh, Steve? Go ahead, Richard. Uh, we talked about it at our last um, Zoom and they're still planning it at the Desmond for the normal uh, time frame in September. Uh, but depending on the COVID regulations, what's going to happen, it may be a hybrid. Uh, they're not sure yet. Um, we're going to be working that out in the next couple months. Great. Um, early on, I, I had discussions with uh, uh, Jeff from the General Grand Encampment, uh, from the Grand Encampment. And uh, he had asked if uh, we would be willing to uh, hold our uh, regionals in the places where the Grand Encampment, last, last cycle, uh, the Grand Encampment was the lead on uh, the uh, regional conferences. And of course they had a lot of uh, contracts set up and uh, that ended up having to be canceled. And as part of those uh, deals, uh, he wanted to know if we would be willing to uh, hold those in the same locations that they had set up. Uh, some some regionals uh, meetings, they always have them in the same place every year. Other regionals, they move them around to different uh, areas. Um, but I told them from my perspective, uh, I'm uh, completely uh, happy with going with uh, the original location that they had planned for last year. Uh, hoping that it'll make it a little easier. Uh, people should already be familiar with, uh, with the setups for those and um, be able to uh, uh, get them uh, set up much more quickly uh, with a little less effort this year. So uh, I, I don't have a lot of specific information and Steve, may, Steve Balke may be able to add a little more light to this. Uh, but uh, right now, I'm not familiar with any regionals that have been set up yet that are in person. Uh, Alabama is getting ready to have their annual sessions uh, the 26th and 27th of uh, 
February, I think. Is that correct, Tom? Yes, yes sir, that's correct. Uh, we've had some traffic here recently. We uh, we feel confident with that it's going to be a scaled back version similar to what our Grand Lodge was. We'll have a banquet on Friday night and registration, and we'll do all three bodies. We'll have their uh, sessions on Saturday, and then we'll finish up, uh, be out of there by Sunday. They're all going to be in one location at the Birmingham Metro York Wright Building. The banquets the uh, and all the business sessions will be right there. The host hotel is a, it's not a double tree, it's a Marriott property, I believe. Yeah. But we've got those, uh, we've got that information out for the registration. And Tom and, and I will be there. there. Great. I have one question, sir. Okay. Yeah. Is, there, sir. Is, is there going to be a, any regional at Tudor this year through Zoom? A regional. In, in Europe? Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work with Norm uh, to uh, set up a regional uh, for Europe. Uh, Europe's a little complicated right now because of all of the COVID restrictions. Yeah. Uh, but as soon as those start opening up some, uh, we'll probably have a uh, regional meeting of the cryptic uh, Masons uh, by themselves. Um, we, we've had issues where the, uh, um, the chapter wants to, uh, run those every year and we felt it is a good time for us to, uh, focus purely on the councils and yeah. the work that the councils are doing and, and trying to work through, uh, any challenges that the councils may have. So, uh, Norm is working on, uh, trying to get something there set up. Uh, and that will likely be in Germany. Okay. Uh, I think his plan is, is to have it in um, uh, dude, I just flanked it. Um, I used to live in Bremerhaven, Germany. <laughs> But uh, anyway, it, it'll, be, uh, it'll be easy to get to. It's the main, main point in Germany for travel. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to get something set up this year for that. Thank you. And put that question a couple of meetings ago about that. That's something completely different. That two books that that you can find at the the web that cryptic mystery education course and that uh, introduction to lessons of cryptic mystery. Are you planning to? Because I can order to Portugal, so I think a PDF edition it will be great. So um, I, I didn't quite catch which two books. Cryptic um, Masonry Education Course and that uh, lessons on cryptic masonry. Yeah, Steve, you want to address that? I can. Uh, Hi, Joe, Steve. Uh, yes, I. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, uh, Joe, uh, we're, we're not going to offer it in PDF because we don't have that worked out with Bob Davis, the author, um, uh, yes. we'll have a hard copy and I can approach him about translations and, uh, how he wants to handle those. And, uh, the last time I talked to him, which admittedly was a while back, uh, he was in the middle of dealing with ice storm. Okay. So uh, he was not able to do anything with it at that point, but we're getting them in stock. Uh, the trustees already pre-approved an order and I'll be able to send hard copies at this point. But uh, as soon as Bob slows down a little bit, which he's grand master of Masons <laughs> at this point. So, uh, <laughs> Um, as soon as it goes down, I'll have the conversation about translations and then we can go there because I think he'd be interested. Yeah, and about the history of the General Council, it will be a, a new edition sometime? Uh, Monty, that, I'm going to switch back to you because you've got uh, a certain couple of folks working on that right now is the third volume of the history. Whoa, 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 whoa. Who? 
I didn't do anything much. Monty, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, yes, I uh, I intended to, uh, uh, or I intend to have two people working on it. Uh, right now, though, uh, I have uh, neglected to actually contact them directly to uh, give them the the tasks. Um, again, I'm I'm kind of chasing my tail in a lot of uh, different situations, so. Uh, I apologize for that, but uh, I will get them working on that just as soon as I possibly can. And we will get that out for distribution as soon as they're done. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Kevin, do you have anything to add on the, on the triennial uh, scene? Uh, no, sir, I don't. Um, I think uh, you know where we're at, so probably not really anything worth bringing up on this call. Uh, we are, you know, basically we're. I'm trying to get uh, uh, copies of the 2017 and the 2020 triennial contracts so that we can work out contract details uh, with uh, one of two hotels in Branson, and um, uh, really not much else to report at that time other than for those that have never been to Missouri and never been to Branson, I think you're probably going to have a really enjoyable trip. We're going to try to make sure that it's uh, very much a family oriented trip, uh, very uh, open and hospitable to um, spouses and girl uh, spouses and children um, or girlfriends, um, but not both. Not both. And um, but um, I'm, I'm really hoping to make this uh, uh, a one of a kind event. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah, you know, I, 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 I immediately gravitated to Branson. Um, my uh, my parents used to actually work in Branson uh, at uh, one of the camping resorts that they have there and uh, was able to see a lot of uh, different shows. Uh, if you at all uh, enjoy uh, good country uh, bluegrass style music, it's a wonderful place. There's so many things to do there uh, uh, with your family. Uh, there's theme parks, there's uh, the different uh, musical and, and uh, all kinds of different shows that you can attend. Uh, it's, it's a pretty amazing place in the middle of the Ozarks. And so it's uh, hopefully will be uh, uh, a very uh, enjoyable time for everybody. To uh, most pleasant, uh, just to give everybody a little bit of an idea of the direction I'm headed. Um, there's a wonderful place called Silver Dollar City where you can see um, what we call old timey uh, types of crafts from glass blowing to uh, handmade uh gifts and and trinkets and and just kind of take you back about 100 years to see how things used to be done uh i'm working on a dinner cruise and uh obviously a couple of shows so that's 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 the direction we're headed outstanding yeah there's there's a uh college there uh called the college of the ozarks that uh they their curriculum covers a lot of the uh, traditional crafts uh, like blacksmithing, uh, trying to keep alive those those skills uh, for uh, today's generation. So uh, I think it's an amazing place. Uh, there's a, a cave tour that you can take while you're at Silver Dollar City as well. That's that's uh, very interesting to take. Um, and you know, there's there's going to be a lot of things that you can do, uh, both. Uh, organized tours that, that we'll have and, and other things that, that you may uh, want to take advantage of while you're there with your family uh, or individually, uh, as, as the case may be. Do we have an approximate date on, on that? Kevin, have you, well, right now I would, I'm gonna say no. Uh, we're looking at uh, trying to get it back into August, maybe early September at the latest. Uh, but we're, we're trying to get it back on the schedule as it was before 
uh, this this past triennial where things get shifted off. Uh, but our our uh, uh, our year, our cryptic year, ends August first um, or July twenty. I'm sorry, July 30th uh, or 31st. I, I don't remember how many days are in July right now. Uh, but uh, it ends at the end of July and it begins in August 1st. So we try to, to make our triennial as close to the beginning of our, our uh, uh, cryptic year uh, for accounting purposes, if nothing else. So, And uh, I have uh, spoken with Steve Tyner and he is... Uh, very supportive of having it in uh, in um, Branson. Uh, it's close to him, and it has a lot of uh, personal meaning for me. So, uh, hopefully, it'll all work out well. Uh, I imagine everybody will fly into uh, the Springfield Airport. Um, for I think for most of the people in the U.S., it'll be relatively easy to get to. Um, for international travels, I'm sure it's going to be a bit of a trek, but uh, I think almost every, uh, no matter where we would go, uh, unless it was at a major hub city, um, uh, international travel is always uh, challenging uh, because of all the different plane changes and stuff that happens. So, uh, but uh, hopefully it'll be a, a good time for everybody and we'll do uh, everything that we can to uh, make sure everybody's accommodated. Any, any other questions? Tom Nesbitt has his hand up. Oh, Tom, go ahead. Hey, Lonnie, I just wanted to uh, let you know why I've got, uh, we were talking about conferences. We are planning the Southeast Regional Conference. Uh, uh, Jim McGee and I have been working together on that one. The encampment will still be just hurt. the same thing with you're breaking up, Tom. For June the 11th and 12th. Southeast. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm here at the lodge, and I'm on a pretty good Wi-Fi. Okay, so to make uh, sure I heard you right. Our Southeast Conference. You're going to have your Southeast Conference June 11th and 12th? That's correct. Okay. Well, you It'll have be in Mobile, cake. just like it was before. Will you have a birthday cake there for me on June 11th? That's my birthday. <laughs> We'll do, we'll definitely work something out. That's personal. Um, well, we've got we we've, we've got that uh, we've got our downtown soiree in uh, Fairhope that night, so we'll probably be able to work something out. Maybe even be able to smoke a cigar. That's purely mercenary on my part, but you know. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, thank you for that. Yes. First cigar flavored birthday cake. Uh, no. <laughs> Thanks for playing though, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> okay um for those of you that may be in the uh uh georgia area um that uh may wish to attend i'm going to be uh, presenting a columbian medal uh to uh, uh see danny warford uh at uh, uh winter council uh, in Auburn, Georgia on the 15th of February. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. It'll be my first in-person uh, meeting uh, for quite some time. I did attend a council meeting up in Atlanta uh, a few months ago, um, but uh, the uh, uh, Grand Master of the Grand Council will, will be in attendance uh, for Georgia and uh, should be a good event. So if you're in the area, uh, hope to see you there. And if you're not in the area, just send good wishes. How's, how's things in uh, in uh, um, Dothan area there, Tom? Oh, pretty good. We just, uh, uh, we've, we've got a slow class uh, in the uh, chapter going right now. Uh, we've done the, the first two degrees there, so we're meeting and we're having reasonably good participation. We've seen a lot of Blue Lodge work. Um, I think in uh, down in our part of the world, it's a little bit more constrained in the bigger cities in Montgomery, uh, Birmingham, and Huntsville. They're seeing a little more impact 
from COVID and are, are a little more cautious with their meeting than we're having to be. Right. But we're, we're blessed down here. Great. Yeah, I'll be uh, driving through, hopefully driving through your neck of the woods on uh, next week, uh, going to see my folks. So. Oh, good. So what else, guys? There's got to be something on your mind that you, there's a burning question. Got to get the hardball questions out. Nothing really. Everybody's happy. Mark, I, I did get your email that you sent uh, earlier uh, a couple of days ago. I haven't responded to it yet. Uh, I'm, I'm working through a couple of things on that, but uh, I will okay. get back to you this week. All right, no problem. So we got to end early again today. Okay. Rick. What's that? Richard Riddick has his hand up. Oh, Rich, go ahead. I'm fairly new to York, right? I uh, I was made a master mason in May of 2016, and I just recently completed service for a year as illustrious master of my local council in in uh, Tri Cities, Washington area. So I, I'm asking a question that probably isn't even really a concern of a general grand council, but I, I recognize there's a lot of experience and wisdom here on this call that I could benefit from. So please forgive if I ask a seemingly petty question. I've, I've noticed that from uh, you know statewide grand council to statewide grand council, um, it, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't pick on the grand councils. I've noticed that from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, the requirements to advance in the York right vary. In my jurisdiction, you have to go Blue Lodge, chapter, council, and then commandery. But in other jurisdictions, I've noticed that you can go straight from Royal Arch chapter to commandery and you can skip council altogether. And I just wanted to, I know the simple answer is, well, each jurisdiction sets their own requirements, but what would be some of the philosophical reasons for skipping the council? General Grand Master, can I take that? Absolutely, Kevin. So uh, my name is Kevin Sample, and I'm the Grand Secretary Recorder for the state of Missouri. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, uh, obviously, each jurisdiction has the, the rights and privileges to do things how they choose, uh, how they see fit. Uh, there are many jurisdictions that belong to the General Grand Council, a voluntary membership, and there are some uh, jurisdictions who don't belong to the General Grand Council. Uh, likewise, uh, for many years prior to I don't know, like the 1950s or 1960s, and I'm generalizing there. Uh, in, in a lot of jurisdictions, there was not a requirement to, and I'm talking about the United States, uh, there was not necessarily a requirement to belong to a council of cryptic masons or royal and select masters actually, in order to belong to uh, the commandery. In our jurisdiction in May of 1966, uh, we made that a prerequisite requirement uh, for membership in the Knights Templar in, in that you had to be a member of the Lodge Chapter Council and Commandery. And those who were members prior to that time were grandfathered in and they were accepted um, as an exception. Uh, so they didn't have to. Um, but um, as far as local membership, um, I think in modern times, uh, it's generally uh, accepted. I think in, I don't know, Monty, is it in all jurisdictions in uh, the United States? No, not yet. Not yet? Okay. Um, I know there's some, some oddball situations, uh, but... Um, 
anyway, it, it, and, and so it, it, again, it depends on your jurisdictional requirements. Um, but each jurisdiction does tend to recognize the rights and, and privileges of its uh, sister joining jurisdictions or York Rite Conference jurisdictions, um, even though they may be different. They, they recognize the, the authority, I guess you will, within that jurisdiction. So not sure if I really answered your question, but. Well, General Grandmaster, if I might, please. Um, this is Steve Balky. Uh, sorry, I'll put on my video now. <laughs> um, so the answer to your question is this is not born of a ritual or an order of degrees or anything like that. This is born of the, the council degrees actually coming in later and more, I'm going to use the word political and acceptance because that's where it lives. And a lot of jurisdictions are, have, have come into a place where the natural successor to Royal Arch is the Royal Master. Not all jurisdictions have, as a matter of fact, the Royal and Select Master in some jurisdictions is actually a part of the Royal Master. It's a really interesting history uh, like Monty said earlier, like the General Grand Master said earlier, um, we're working on the third piece in the three volume set that is thus far our history. Uh, and the first two volumes take you up through about the 1920s. And most of this happened after that. And that's where things coalesce. A lot of jurisdictions look just like Missouri, like Kevin was describing. In 1950, 1960, we're adopting, we're in, in for a penny and for a pound, and the cryptic degrees are between the Royal Arch and the Commandery. Uh, we still have one non-cryptic Mason in New Mexico, one singular, and uh, he's still living. So uh, that, that's great, but everybody now goes through all three and and but that is that is not necessarily the case uh i can tell you that in uh, the international community it is the case it it was accepted by the time that we were we were establishing york right in other in in international jurisdictions so does that get close to an explanation to uh, that Yes, it does. It sounds like it was a historical um, development. General Master. This is, okay. this, is Steve. this is this is the other Steve. Um, I know in in uh, I think there are about half, probably less than half a dozen jurisdictions in the United States now where you're not required to be a uh, cryptic mason to become a Knight Templar. I know in New York State, that's one of them. And basically it's the decision of the Grand Commandery of what they require as a prerequisite to take the orders. And uh, in New York, they only require the Holy Royal Arch. They do not require any of the, um, any of the cryptic degrees. Um, I'm also active in Massachusetts here even though they are not members of the general grand chapter or general grand council, but it, I'm working on that. Um, we have um, where it is required you, you, and, and they put that into place in the early 1960s where you had to have the uh, select master degree to qualify to become a Templar. No rhyme, or, uh, no rhyme or reason, probably more political at this point than anything else. That are not wanting to make changes to the Constitution and bylaws. Um, General Grandmaster? Yes, sir. I, okay, so may I try and um, also add something to that? Absolutely. So instead of focusing on the reasons why we're not part of the three sections of the York Rite, and trying to focus on why a Master Mason should become a part of uh, the Cryptic Masons. I've always felt that it was a, a matter of leadership. 
And you have to make yourself relevant. And if you want to talk about why a master mason should think about wanting to become a cryptic mason, um, we need to focus on a couple things. Number one, the, the degrees that are known or are focused on are going to be your mark master degree because that's a part, uh, that's a functional part, a large part of English masonry, the Grand, Grand Lodge of, uh, royal, of, of Mark Masters. A lot of people talk about the Royal Arch degree and how that's relevant because it completes the story and, the, and what we lost in the third degree was recovered. And then everybody's aware of Knight's Templar. So therefore you have these two large, well-known bodies. And the question is, is, so why should we consider cryptic masonry? I've always tried to explain to young masons that the three degrees of masonry is only the one part of a really great book. And if you want to know more about all the chapters of the great book, then you really need to listen to all the degrees. We take our Blue Lodge degrees and we end up with, uh, with an unfinished section. All we know is that something is lost and, and we're, we're sitting there wondering when that story might or might not be completed. In the uh, one of the beautiful degrees that I really love is the Mark Master degree in the Royal Arch. To me, it's it's important because I travel around the world, and as I go through a lot of the old buildings, uh, Mont Saint Michel as an example, uh, and I walk on those stones and I look down and I see those marks. It reminds me, it brings me back to the lessons that I learned in the Mark Master degree. Of course, I pay attention to the Royal Royal. Uh, the um, Royal Arch degree, because that's important to all of us as Masons, because we want to know probably what the end is. For some people, the end is more important than the middle. But then we lose sight of the fact of why we should take the cryptic degrees. And why we should take the cryptic degrees is because one of the most beautiful degrees in all of Masonry is the Royal Master degree. Done well, that chat that Hiram Abiff has with the young master mason as he walks around. If you pick a really great ritualist and walks him around the lodge, you will be blown away and it, you won't be able to stop talking to other masons as to why they should experience the cryptic degrees. And then it's an easy sell if you want to talk somebody into going into commandery because all you have to do is mention you can become a Knight Templar. And for most people, that's enough for them to want to experience to become a Knight Templar. But the Royal Master Degree and the Select Master Degrees are such important degrees because if one talks about reaching your goal, you're talking about the Royal Arch Degrees. But if you want to complete the story and you want to talk about the middle and how what was lost was preserved, then you really need to experience our degrees as well. And I think that there's nothing more than having that conversation with a young master mason to sit there and say, I'm willing to do both of those on my travels towards reaching a Knight Templar. Um, leadership, I think in all orders <clears throat> is the most important part of anybody. You can have somebody that's a great administrator. You can have somebody that can be a great ritualist an order is only as relevant as having a charismatic person at the top. If you have a leader that somebody's willing to follow to the edge of the cliff and say, I like you so much and I respect you so much that I'm willing to go where you go, then I think that we can take our cryptic mason degrees and we can take it to that next level. But it's important for us in, in addition to having those degrees to make sure that we're very careful about who we choose to take the helm of our cryptic masons local councils and most importantly who we choose to be grand master of our grand council of the state that we belong to because where he goes and the way that he speaks to the masons that he affects during his year really speaks towards the success of grand council of cryptic masons throughout the united states and throughout the world so that's my two cents very well said robert yeah, yeah, and uh, master, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, go ahead, Joe. No, no, go, go, and I speak after. So, sorry. Uh, 
I, I just wanted to, to make a comment uh, about the uh, Royal Master degree. Uh, uh, Robert, uh, I'm sure you, you are probably aware of this term, but uh, I, I remember when I first saw the Royal Master degree when I was going through the degrees. And uh, in Hawaii, we have a term, uh, chicken skin, uh, uh, more commonly referred to as goosebumps. And I, the, I was blessed to have a ritualist who, uh, who played the role of Hiram. And um, it, it, it was very moving. And uh, I, I do agree, it's one of the more beautiful, uh, if not the most beautiful uh, parts that exist in, uh, in masonry today. Um, so yeah, it, it's, uh, I, I agree on all, all the points that you said, it's important to have good leadership. Uh, I think that in the past, um, cryptic masons have been willing to accept uh, the position of being, for lack of a better term, the runt of the litter. Uh, we were kind of the middle child that is often overlooked. Um, but uh, it's, it's my goal uh, to, to put forth cryptic masonry as a, a leader in uh, York Rite masonry, uh, to, to not stand above our, our companions in the uh, Royal Arch or those in the uh, uh, Grand Commanderies, but to stand as equals and, and to show pride in, in our degree work and what we stand for and the lessons that we teach and bring to the table. Uh, I think it's, it's very important for us all to, to be proud of that and to uh, communicate that in the strongest manner as possible uh that that we have something that is not optional but is necessary uh to have a full understanding of just what york right masonry really means so joan i have also a question thank you for for your words and Robert also I have one question that also have to connect with um, the degrees. I found in my uh, website, in my internet travels, that a, a Grand Council of Masons of Western Canada, I think, uh, that is not affiliated to the General Grand Council, but this Grand Council has inside uh, a Grand Lodge of Royal Ark Mariners. It is possible? It's possible because that they have one one lodge of Royal Ark Mariners, of course. But how, how does that thing happen? Uh, are you asking how do you become a member of the Royal Ark? Mariners? Know, the Grand Council of Cryptic Great Masons of Western Canada, inside of the of the of the Grand Council, as a, they they have a Grand Lodge of Royal Ark Mariners that are a part of the Grand Council. Yeah, they follow the English system, which has their degrees uh, set up very differently from uh, from what we do in the American right. Um, and I don't know if there's anybody on the call that's a little more familiar with the uh, British degree system uh, for uh, York right than I am. Um, Can we import the Grand Lodge of Royal Ark Mariners to, to a Grand Council? No. Yeah, in, in the United States, uh, the uh, Royal Ark Mariners is actually part of the Allied Masonic degrees. Yes, I know, I know. Uh, but uh, uh, any any jurisdictions that follow the uh, the uh, English system, it's it's usually under the uh, the councils there. Under the uh, council, okay, thank you. So beyond that, uh, the likelihood of me misstating something is is high. <laughs> so I don't want to get too uh, too deep into the English system because I'm not really well versed in it. Uh, but I'm certainly happy to let anybody else. Uh, okay, so it was just a question because I think I, I've traveled along to the Grand Council's website, and, and I think it's the only Grand Council that I know that is that is inside of of, of the Grand Council, a Grand Lodge of Royal Mariners. Yeah, and, and we do share recognition between the two. Uh, the American uh, uh, 
uh, Royal Arc Mariner and the um, and the, the British the, version yeah, the British, you recognize yes, yes. one another, so you're yeah. able to attend each other's meetings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most recent. Yes, sir. I'd like to direct a comment to, I don't know everyone's title, so I'll just call him Companion Robert, the one who, uh, I think he was the second one to speak in answer to my question. I want to thank him for mentioning the Royal Master degree, because that is one of my favorite degrees, especially because of the, uh, the advice that Hiram Biff gives to Adniram. Uh, in our Tri Cities York Wright bodies, we had a we had a mighty oak fall this past week, middle of the week. Most illustrious companion Floyd Snyder passed away. I don't know what years he was our most illustrious grandmaster, but Floyd was a, a long time fixture in the York Wright in this area with uh, numerous honors and positions and titles, but. He always just liked to be called brother or companion. But he had that um, monologue of Heiner and Biff memorized. And he always did, he always played that role when we did the Royal Master degree. He did it very well. And uh, now he's laid down his tools. So he, he very much affected me when I received the Royal Master degree, just in the way he did that that monologue. God rest his soul. Thank you. Amen to that. Um, yeah, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're at a time where we're losing a lot of greats in masonry. Uh, but I'm also hopeful that there are a lot of uh, people waiting in the wings to step up and fill those very big shoes that they leave behind. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of dedication and work uh, to to master the degree work that's necessary to uh, really convey uh, the messages that that we have to to offer to the craft. Um, I was I was fortunate enough to have uh, a mentor who was uh, a tremendous ritualist, and I had a gift, I guess, for for memorization and. He told me early on, he says, you know, you will be a good ritualist, but you won't be a great ritualist until you learn to love the work. And, and I think it really shines through when you go from the point of regurgitating something that you've memorized to the point of you're sharing, you're telling a story and, and you're, uh, you're using the tools of a storyteller more than someone who's just saying words that are on a piece of paper and the emotion that you get from it, the, the feeling uh, is, is really the difference between night and day. Um, it's, you know, I, I know that a lot of uh, councils have trouble uh, finding people to do ritual work. Uh, particularly who have the time and, and ability to memorize. Uh, but it really takes away from the degree work if you have to read it. Um, so um, I guess in terms of priority, uh, if you can't do anything else but read it, read it. If you can't do anything but regurgitate it, regurgitate it. But really to make it hit home and sink in and, and be moving to the candidates, uh, you really have to uh, internalize it and really from the heart do whatever part, no matter how small it is, because uh, every single part in every degree that we do throughout masonry uh, is, is vital to, to expressing uh, a lesson or an allegory or a concept that uh, drives us in our daily lives. Most important, I wanted to add one more thing. Um, you know, for many years uh, in, in my local area, I have been what's called a camel herder. <laughs> and so for those of you that aren't familiar with the term, the camel herder, I'm, I'm the person that leads the class through uh, the Royal Arch degrees and the council degrees and the commander orders. 
Um, and as I take the class back up into the dining room after each degree, I kind of go through the degree that they just received and kind of ask them for their feedback and then maybe explain some of the things that kind of went by that they didn't notice. But I also point out things that they're about to experience and it'll be more fully explained, but I want them to pay attention and look for this particular interaction because it'll be important to you when you hear this. Um, and so in the, in the Royal Master Degree, I talk about that, you know, there's gonna be an interaction that's going to happen with one of the characters that you've grown to love, Hiram Abiff, as he talks to, uh, as he talks to another character and he's gonna walk around the lodge room. And I want you to listen carefully to that, to that conversation, that easygoing conversation, those lessons that Hiram Abiff is trying to teach to us. I want you to hear Hiram Abiff as he talks to King Solomon, because it might escape some people, but I want you to listen to that dialogue that, that Hiram Abiff has with King Solomon. When King Solomon looks at that beautiful piece of work and then gives his instruction as to what to do with it, and to place it in the archives of the lodge that it might be displayed. And then as we go into the select master work, there's, a, um, there's an apron lecture that happens there. And that apron lecture that happens, that explanation that happens in front of the class is one of the singular most beautiful apron lectures that ever unfolds to candidates. I ask every member of my class, every class that I've ever had, I said, you may not be the greatest ritualist in the world, but if you enjoy the degrees that are presented to you this afternoon, I want you to think about the one part that you really truly love that you connected with. And if you do only one thing, I would like you to find your one part in masonry, that singular piece of ritual, however long or short it may be, whether, um, whether it's a part of the Blue Lodge degrees, whether it's a difficult part like delivering Hiram Abiff, whether it's a simple part like these, that, uh, that apron lecture or something small. And I want you to learn that, that one part. And if that's the only thing that you do in masonry the whole year, I want you to practice that one part until just like our most poison says, I want it to become a story. I don't want it to sound like something you memorized. I want it to sound like an easy conversation that you're having with another Mason. And what you're doing is you're really paying respect to the person that gave it to you when you learned it. And I think that if we can impart that to each of our classes and you can be the cryptic Mason that imparts these to the candidates for these degrees. Again, everything is about relevancy. You know, you can be a part of the chapter, you can be a part of the council, you can be a part of the commandery. You can choose to be number three, the stepchild of the three orders, or you can turn around and you can focus on how I can be the relevant part of those three parts. When I was a grandmaster a long time ago, the one thing that I was absolutely bent on as I started my year was that I was not going to be number three. And throughout my entire year, I singularly picked every member of my council to make sure that as we went through every reception that we had, the communication that I gave, the conversation that I gave, the focusing on the achievements of all of my council members, chapter members, commandery members, worshipful masters, wherever they may be, I wanted people to realize that as the head of my body, that I could be the best leader of what I could control. I can't control what everybody else does, but I can control the relevancy of what I provide. And so I think moving forward, I think relevancy, choosing our leaders properly, making sure that we take time, don't choose the most popular person. Choose the person that's gonna be the most engaging. Choose the person that's going to be the teacher and choose the one that's going to be the person that other people will follow. If you can do that, and you can do that for three or four years, we'll no longer be the middle child. We won't be the stepchild. We'll be the order that people want to join. And that's, we need to remain focused on that. And I, I think that council has an, a tremendous amount to offer, but we have to be willing to put ourselves out there. I'm sorry, I took a lot of time. I'm no. really passionate about what I do. Very, very well said and important. Important information. So, 
thank you very much. And you did an outstanding job of being Grandmaster, so. So anybody else have anything to add? Um, oh, most important. Yeah, I, I want just to qu quickly to comment. It's just interesting to observe how how conversation take, uh, what, what course conversation take. And uh, in my perception, it just reflects the fact that uh, ritualistic work, especially memorization is so important for us as Masons for, uh, for rectifying uh, Masonic values for more proper implementation in life. And uh, talk, this part was talking about importance of cryptic degrees in whole Masonic work. Where it's, it's really, it's like taking, if not taking cryptic degrees, it's like taking words from a song. That's what I want to comment. Thank you, Nikolai. <clears throat> Tom, um, did you have something else, else to add? Uh, yes, sir, Grandmaster. Um, I do hire them a Biff, and generally wherever I'm at at a reunion. And actually, since I raised my hand between you and companion Whitfield, you pretty much said everything that I was going to say, how rewarding that part is and how important it is to learn, the, to learn that work and then I say practice it, but I mean more than just memorize it, but to actually learn the message and get used to, to transmitting the message. There's more there than just the words. And that presentation is what really, really makes the degree go. But it's very rewarding to do that work with a guy that's just coming through. Yeah. You, can, you can feel the connection. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, I there's there's parts in in all of our degree work that that tend to stand out you know things like the senior deacons parts in the blue lodge and uh the principal sojourners and the uh commander for the uh uh, uh commandery orders um particularly the order of the temple uh all of those are are just outstanding and impactful roles uh, but, you know, I, I still believe as well that, you know, if, if your only role is to say agreed and nod your head, uh, that's just as important as the, the longer monologue parts, because again, it helps, it's kind of the, the mortar that ties everything together. Um, so, you know, whether or not you're uh, a craftsman or um, a high shower or any of the other smaller parts, they are important and um i think that you know uh, as as robert said you know find the part that moves you the most uh and that will uh result in your passion showing through your work and every time you put that work on and you display that level of passion uh you will be impacting someone else who in time will uh, replace you. And I think that uh, that's something else that we all should uh, always keep an eye on is, is that uh, part of our ultimate goal as, as leaders and, and, and ritualists is to uh, make sure that we uh, contribute to developing our own replacements uh, and building good leaders and building good ritualists uh, and, and also be ready to return back to our, our spots on the sidelines and being just as an enthusiastic supporters of those that have taken over and, and uh, have leadership roles or ritualistic roles and, and be there to, to guide and support. And uh, I think that uh, that is something that, it's an aspect of masonry that just always moves me when I see it in action. And uh, so. Lord knows I would not be here if it wasn't for all the great support that I've gotten from people uh, all along the way in, uh, in my relatively short time in masonry. So uh, I've, I've been truly blessed to have great mentors and, and teachers along the way. General Grandmaster. Yes, sir. Larry Bennett. Uh, 
I, I didn't get a chance to write down those dates with for uh, most illustrious companion Danny Walford. Did you say it was 15 February at Auburn? Uh, yeah, it's uh, 15 February at 8.30 p.m. at uh, Winder Council in Auburn, Georgia. Okay, that's Winder. Winder Lodge, yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I got it. Thank you, sir. I'll do my best to be there. Yeah, my, my, my heart's in the south, but my education is still in the north. So <laughs> oh, it's kind of, it's kind of, there's a lot of places it's hard to pronounce. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. So anything else, guys? This is this has been a great conversation. These are the kind of kind of conversations I really like to see in these fireside chats. Um, I I'm not someone who likes to drive a conversation. I just like to participate in them. Um, you know, when when I jump on here, uh, it's it's not intended for me to uh, participate as the general grand master, but more to participate as a companion and to uh, to help facilitate, but but uh, try to uh, encourage open conversations about anything. And uh, I really appreciate it that everybody has, has jumped in and, and shared their thoughts and ideas. And I hope that you will continue. Um, I hope that you continue to hold me accountable in my role as General Grand Master. Uh, that's important to me. Uh, I don't want to be surrounded by a whole bunch of people that say, yeah, you're doing a great job and yeah, yeah, yeah. And then them not be satisfied. Um, I can take criticism. Uh, I can I can handle tough questions. Uh, I may not like them, but uh, that doesn't mean that I don't give them serious thought and, and do my best to to answer those questions to the best of my ability. Uh, and I definitely don't have answers to everything, but I will do everything in my power to find the answer uh, to answer your question. And I also can't promise you're going to like the answer, uh, but it will be an answer. And uh, so, uh, like I say, please uh, continue to hold me and my officers accountable for our work. And that will only help us become better and stronger at what we do. Um, and if there's nothing else, I'll give you guys back the rest of your afternoons and evenings and uh, let you guys uh, spend some time with your family. Last call. Thank Nothing. you, sir. Okay. Uh, Tom, General, want to, uh, go ahead, Steve. Uh, General Grandmaster, I'd just like to do a shout out to Richard. And if we can find plants like that, <laughs> that was a great conversation. That's the best conversation I've seen on a Zoom meeting in a while. And I really would like to reiterate what you said. That was fantastic, Richard. Please keep coming. Absolutely. Well, thank you for making me feel welcome. I sure appreciate it. Absolutely. And, and, and share this with all the, the younger companions. This isn't, uh, this isn't for those that have uh, climbed the ranks and hold all the bling and titles and all kinds of things. This is, this is for everybody in cryptic masonry. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to learn and share and, and develop ourselves. So uh, please uh, encourage any of your fellow companions that might have an interest to jump in and and uh, sh share their questions and share their answers. And Tom, do you have anything else before we close? Uh, no, sir, I don't. Okay. Good meeting. And uh, my uh, my deputy general Grant, he sends his apologies for not being here, but he had to deal with some other uh, non-Mason duties. So, uh, but he does send his apologies. So with that, uh, uh, Tom, why don't you uh, give us a, a closing prayer and we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to meet for the great discussions that we've had. Um, this has been a wonderful experience. And I think each and every one of us who has participated has been enriched by having this meeting. In your holy name we pray, amen.
So I'm gonna, I gotta I gotta start remembering to say last names because I actually met Tom Nesbitt, but Tom, you did a great <laughs> job. <laughs> so with that, guys, uh, I uh, bid you peace and uh, I wish you the best of health and and the uh, happiest of new years. And uh, please uh, stay safe and we will see you next month. Same back. Great, great meeting, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We look forward to seeing you.